Hello, and welcome back to more Films Under Constant Critique, where we take a look at films, some good, some bad, and some downright awful. I'm Bongo Baikov, joined by our host, Maverick Drenzaria. This week, we were taking a look at the film The Abyss, from 1989. Yeah, so our last podcast, I asked if we could do an actual movie next, and yeah, this will suffice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucking hell. Uh <laughs> So, The Abyss was released on August 9th, 1989. It cost about $45 million and made $90 million. Okay. So, not terrible, but definitely not amazing. Yeah. Especially considering this is a James Cameron movie, and I mean... That, that actually surprised me how low that was for a James Cameron movie. Granted, this is before Terminator 2 and, like, Titanic, uh, yes. where he was making a Titanic amount of money with his movies. <laughs> <sighs> or, like, the Avatar movies. I, I still can't believe he's doing that many Avatar movies. I know, we have three more sequels on the way. Speaking of which, this was written and directed by James Cameron, who... Mm. We've had him before. Yeah, we've done Aliens and we've done True Lies. Correct, and now this. Um, uh, and then, kind of, Rambo First Blood Part 2? He did write that, yeah, that's true. Um... But he did not direct it. But yeah, he did work on it. And if we do a uh, Galaxy of Terror or uh, Battle Beyond the Stars, I think he did like set design on those two movies. Oh yeah, he did. I remember right? <laughs> if you want to do a Roger Corman movie at some point. <laughs> We're gonna have to at some point. I, I feel like Battle Beyond... We could do, like, a double feature of, like, Star Crash and Battle Beyond the Stars or something. Um, but yeah, he, he also did the first two Terminator movies. He's done a lot of movies. You know, Titanic, Avatar, some of the highest grossing movies of all time. If a movie has made a lot of money, it might be a James Cameron movie, basically. <laughs> um... And if the movie took a lot of money to make, it might be a James Cameron movie. What was the budget for Avatar? And if it involves water, it probably is a James <laughs> Cameron movie. <laughs> Avatar was $237 million. I mean, you can see the money while you're watching in one of his movies. Like, you can. You can. And now I'm just thinking of that South Park song about James Cameron. <laughs> I was actually about to mention that uh, if we should throw it in every time we mention James Cameron. Uh, the cast. Uh, most of these we have not had before. Which is a little surprising for some of them. Like Ed Harris. We have not had Ed yes. Harris before. That surprises me a bit. Because um, I really like Ed Harris, actually. Um... He's in Creep Show. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> I did not. He's in one of the segments from Creep Show. He's also in a lot of astronaut movies because he's in the right stuff. He's in Apollo 13. Apollo 13. Gravity. Oh, I forgot he was in Gravity. Yeah, I, I don't blame you. Um, <laughs> not an astronaut movie, but he was in The Rock. Yeah, he's in The Rock. He's in The Truman Show. He's the guy that created oh, yeah. the, the Truman Show. <laughs> uh, National Treasure Book of Secrets. He's in that. <laughs> he's in a lot of movies. He, he was in a Jackson Pollock biopic. Huh. Where he played Jackson Pollock and he also directed the movie. So there's that. Um... Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio, which I was looking at her filmography, and I was surprised at how short it was. Seems like things just kind of fall off after the 90s for whatever reason. Um, yeah, it kind of looks like that. She was in 
Like Robin Hood? Yeah, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, Scarface, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Al Pacino one, and The mm. Color of Money. So, so she was in quite a few recognizable movies, but for whatever reason, she just, I don't know. She was in a couple of TV shows, though. Uh, she was probably in the new Punisher series. Oh, really? Okay. I haven't seen it, so... The one with, uh... John Bernthal? Is that the one? Yes, yes. Oh, we've had this guy before. Michael Bean. Because he played Hicks in Aliens. Yep. And he's also Kyle Reese in The Terminator. And Johnny Ringo in Tombstone. And in this movie, he basically has the same mustache that he has in Tombstone. <laughs> I actually wrote down, because I don't, I'm don't. i used to seeing how he looks in like that first Terminator movie. And so I see him with a mustache and it just feels wrong. But I, I was like, the whole time I was watching this movie, I was just thinking of Johnny Ringo from Tombstone, because he looks exactly... <laughs> the only thing he's missing is the cowboy hat. And he plays a bad guy in both this and Tombstone. So, you know, I guess when Kyle Reese has a mustache, he's a bad guy. So, <laughs> I don't know. Um, Chris Elliott, who most people would know for Groundhog Day. Hmm. I'm trying to remember his character's name from that, but he's like one of the... He's like the camera guy from Groundhog Day. Ah, uh, shit. What was his name? Larry. That's right, Larry. And I was also watching Manhunter recently. I forgot he was in Manhunter as well. Huh. Was that supposed to be... Is that like the, um... It was the first Hannibal the Lecter movie. Red Dragon movie. adaptation? It was the first yep. Hannibal yep. Lecter movie, and yes, it was an adaptation of Red Dragon. He was also in Scary Movies 2 and 4. In Scary Movies 2 and 4, Jesus. Um, Kimberly <laughs> Scott, who was in Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. <laughs> Your favorite Batman movies. Yay! Batman Forever. <laughs> I like how it's Batman Forever that, like, is the one that pisses you off. Because it seems like everybody's pissed off with <laughs> Batman and Robin. Rather than Batman Forever. Yeah, no, I, I I have no problems with Batman and Robin. It's got Arnold Schwarzenegger in it. I have many problems with Batman Forever. Honestly, fair enough. Um, I, I I mean, I, I don't disagree with you. But it's, I'm just surprised at just how much you hate that movie, though. Because, like, I just watched and I'm like, it's just another bad movie. Like, maybe it's because you haven't seen Suicide Squad, so I know how bad it gets as far as superhero <laughs> movies go. <laughs> oh, this is another name you might know. Dick Warlock. <laughs> Dick Warlock's in the movie? Yeah. <laughs> I was looking at Wikipedia earlier, and that name caught my eye. Although, it said it, he was credited as Richard Warlock on this one. Hmm, but I looked, I checked to make sure it was the same guy. Uh, but Dick Warlock played Michael Myers in Halloween 2. Hmm. He was also in Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Had an uncredited role in Spider-Man as Man on Roof. Oh, huh. I still lost stunts on a lot of movies. I noticed, yeah. including there were. If you look at the filmography, half of it's just stunts. Including work. some we've done, if I remember right, because the thing is listed on there, and Escape hmm. from New York, as well as a bunch of other ones that we will probably end up doing. We, we if we do a Soylent Green podcast, apparently he did stunts on that. If we do a Rocketeer podcast, oh. he did stunts on that. We're doing the Running Man eventually, and guess what? He did yep, the stunts he's in that. for that. He did stunts for Blazing Saddles and Jaws. And Spaceballs, apparently. Huh. And Commando, as well as Commando. We'll probably do a Commando podcast. I'm not going to promise that, but it might happen. I feel it's like on the table. <laughs> I feel like it would make a good podcast. Um, 
And then if we don't do that on the podcast, I could, like, say, uh, remember how I promised I was going to do Commando on this podcast? I lied. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the music was done by Alan Silvestri, and we haven't had him since the Super Mario Brothers movie. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, I didn't know it was the same guy. But he's some... I mean, his filmography is, like, really extensive. Um, hmm. I just didn't know it was the Mario guy. Because uh, he did the music for Back to the Future. I mean, that's hmm. kind of a big deal, right? Um, who Framed Roger Rabbit, Forrest Gump, Castaway. If Robert Zemeckis did it, he probably did the music for it. Um... Predator, this, bunch of other stuff that I'm not, I'm not going to read all of it off. Um, it looks like he was involved with quite a few Marvel uh, with, uh, which Marvel ones? movies. Um, uh, Captain America, the first Avenger, uh, he was conductor and orchestrator. Infinity War, uh, uh, he was score composer. Um, initial th- Thoughts. Um, I. I guess I'll start with this one. Um, so my DVD and Blu-ray collection is alphabetized, which makes this the first movie on my DVD shelf. <laughs> That's yeah, that makes sense for anybody that wanted to know that. Um. <laughs> So I watched this on a DVD, if anybody doesn't know. Um, I kind of wish I watched this in Blu-ray quality, though. I, I bet it looks amazing in, like, 1080p, you know. Mm-hmm. But, like, even, like, watching it on DVD, I can tell, yeah, this looks... This is a pretty good-looking movie. Um, I'd only seen this movie once. Um, and it was quite a while ago. So I remembered, like... I remembered a few parts of it, but not, like, uh, not a ton of it, I guess. And I remembered it being a good movie. Not a great one, but a good one. Um, And it's become very obvious since this movie that James Cameron loves movies that take place in water. (laughs) Any chance he gets, he'll go under the ocean to make another movie. Because, you know, you got Titanic, you got Way of Water. He did a bunch of documentaries about, like, you know, where he went underwater and shit. Um, I guess he just made this movie and that got him obsessed with submersibles or something. I don't know. Um, so rewatching this, I, I still think it's a pretty good movie it's not his it's not his best work but i then again it is kind of hard to compete with stuff like aliens or terminator 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 2 you know that's a pretty heady competition right there you know and like but i think i think it deserves a little more attention because it's a decent movie for what it is you know it's just it's just kind of sandwiched in between some of james cameron's other you know more popular movies so a lot of people don't remember it and the fact it wasn't a huge box office success might also be why it's a little more obscure compared to the other ones you know but anyway So, uh, sort of like you, uh, I'd only ever seen this movie once before. I think it was about like a year, year and a half ago that I would have watched it. Uh, I, we ended up, uh, when we watched, when I watched it for the first time, I ended up streaming it at my parents' place and they have this 4K TV and, uh, you're right. It looks absolutely gorgeous, uh, when it's in 4K. Uh, that being said, I do agree with you it's a good movie i don't think i would put it near james cameron's best movies it's It's, probably in the middle i would say yeah yeah because it's visually a very stunning movie there's a lot of great character moments and a lot of great acting but there's also a lot of walking around a submarine it's a little slow Uh, yeah yeah 
And it is a very long movie. It is, I think, what, two hours, 20 minutes? Depending on two which and a half version hours, something you like that. watch. Because, okay, that's another thing I should point out What since we're recording now. I watched the <clears throat> special edition of it, which is almost three hours long. <laughs> Ooh. Because the, the theatrical cut is... How long is the theatrical cut? Uh, it's 140 minutes, so two hours, 20 minutes. Okay, the... The special edition was like two hours, 51 minutes or something. Ooh. It's really long. Um, yeah, I, I only watched the theatrical cut for this one, and even I felt that two hours, 20 minutes felt a bit long. Um, and there's some people that say the special edition is the better version, and maybe mm. it is. I haven't, I haven't watched the theatrical version in a really long time. Um, But from what I can tell, the special edition added, well, one huge thing it added was the scene with a tidal wave. I don't know if you've heard about that. Uh, I don't know about that one. It, 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 was the, it was towards the end of the movie. I think it's because they didn't have the, I think it's because when they were first doing the movie, they, they just didn't have enough money to do the special effects for that part or something oh, okay. is what I heard. I, I don't know exactly, but they like the bit. What well, I, maybe I'll just talk to talk about that when we get to that part of the movie. Um, it mm. also added more cold war elements. There's like more talk about like nuclear war and stuff. But beyond those changes, I don't know what else was extended. Because, honestly, it didn't seem that different from how I remembered it. Granted, it's been a while since I watched the theatrical cut. Really, the only thing I could tell was, like, that it just felt like a longer movie <laughs> it was. So, anyway. Hmm. Um... But as far as I can remember, it it didn't really affect the quality that much, at least not for me anyway. Um, but who knows? Maybe maybe the theatrical version is the, you know isn't as good as I remember. I don't know. Uh, another thing that's kind of interesting is nineteen eighty nine had a few other alien themed movies that took place underwater. That's really specific. What else? Leviathan. Came out that Leviathan year. was the other big one that got. Oh, okay. like which and leviathan's not like it's not a very well regarded movie but it does have like it's like a cult film now and i actually mm. enjoy that movie i'll be honest it's 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 not like amazing but if you want like a kind of the thing slash alien underwater it's pretty entertaining and it has a decent cast okay. it has a good cast you got peter weller richard Crenna. Ernie Hudson, Daniel Stern. I mean, it has a good cast huh. to it, at the least. Um, and it's directed by the same guy that did Rambo First Blood Part 2. Yeah. Ooh, okay, yeah. Now, that's that's at least sounds like it could be fun at points, if not Like I good. said, it's a fun movie. It's not a great movie, but it's entertaining hmm. to watch. Um, and then there were a few other ones. There's this one called Deep Star 6. I feel like I've heard of that one. Which is not a good movie. Miguel Ferrer is in it. I fucking love that guy! Oh, so, wait. That means two of these... <laughs> that means two of these movies have Robocop connections. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember much of Deep Star 6. Um, oh my god, wait, what? Apparently the Rent guy is in it as well. Like from Spider Man? Yeah, the rent guy from the Spider Man movies. Huh. But yeah, I don't I don't remember much of Deep Star Six. Aside from it was it was just not it wasn't as good as obviously it wasn't as good as the Abyss. Definitely it wasn't as good as Leviathan. Yeah. Um And all three of those movies came out in nineteen eighty nine, and then there were a few other ones. There was The Rift, which came out in nineteen ninety. And that one has Arlie, Ermy, and... Oh my god. 
another RoboCop connection because <laughs> Ray Wise is in it. And he really? was RoboCop and also played Leland Palmer in Twin Peaks. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> and then there was one called Lords of the Deep. I don't know if... I'm going to laugh if this one has a RoboCop connection as well. Oh, would you look <laughs> at that? It's directed by Paul Verhoeven. No, I'm kidding. Um, I don't think it does. Roger Corman is in it, though. Really? As it is an huh. uncredited cameo role. It was produced by... Oh, that's why. It was produced by Roger Corman. Okay. So that's the Roger Corman version sense. of The Abyss, basically. But yeah, all these movies came out around the same time, for some reason. But anyway, um, and would you believe it's it... It's a golden era for water movies, Would huh? you believe it? None of these movies are as good as The Abyss. <laughs> Although, like I said, Leviathan is an entertaining movie, at the least. If anything, at some point, maybe we should do a Leviathan podcast. I feel like that might be kind of... Well, I'll, uh, I'll throw that onto our big... Uh, onto my big running list of ideas. Leviathan. You're gonna add Superman Solar on there, maybe? <laughs> um... Oh, uh, Leonard Maltin. <laughs> Ooh, I'm gonna guess that he liked this movie. I'm gonna guess that he gave it a three and a half. Three and a half? So you think it's better than Batman Forever? <laughs> I do, yes. He gave it three out of four. Uh, okay, okay. Well, he thought it was as good as Batman Forever, apparently. <laughs> he said it was... He said it was a spectacular underwater saga. Better as an underwater adventure than futuristic sci-fi. With a couple of crises too many. But still a fascinating one-of-a-kind experience. Okay. You know, I think I I think I agree with that actually. I think Leonard and I are on the same page here. He's still your mortal enemy though, I assume, because He's still my mortal enemy, but we, we agree on this. I have like a long list of like <laughs> ratings from Leonard Malton. Maybe we should just go through those at some point. Okay, so the story uh, the plot of this one, there is a hurricane. They go underwater in submarines and meet aliens. There you go. There's the plot. <laughs> yeah. I got lazy with it. Uh, well, no, they don't just meet aliens. They also meet Michael Bean wielding a nuke. And a pretty weird... And a pretty weird mustache. Ed Harris and his wife are going through, like... Are going through marital problems. Just like every other married couple in these movies. Yeah, yeah. But was there anything else we need to add with the plot? Or no, no, we we got it. Michael Bean's got a nuke and a bad mustache. There's aliens in the water. That's really it. Chris Elliott is there. <laughs> the Soviets are there trying to get to a submarine that sank. I guess. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is another. Yeah. Of course, this movie came out in the 80s. <laughs> Gotta have the Russians. So, of um, course it has to have the Soviet Union. Okay. So, the, one thing I found interesting at the beginning is, uh... And appa appa but apparently this is only in the special edition. Um, It starts off with a Nietzsche quote. Which Nietzsche quote? It was... Um, wh which one do you think? The movie's called The Abyss. <laughs> okay, that's a good point. <laughs> you know, it's uh, if you haven't heard it, it's this famous quote: "If you stare it, into the abyss, the abyss stares long back." Abyss. You know, yeah, yeah. 
which d makes, if you're watching the special edition, that makes this the second movie we've done to start with the Nietzsche quote because Conan the Barbarian had one as well, although it was a different quote. I forgot Conan started with a Nietzsche quote. Yeah, it was, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, or something like that, which makes mm. sense for Conan. Um, <laughs> what's next? Are we gonna do... We're gonna do another movie with a Nietzsche quote. Like, what Nietzsche quote would you have in front of, like, Total Recall? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're just gonna do it. We're, we're just gonna do, like, uh, Oh, wait, I thought of what? If one fights with monsters, one must not become a monster themselves. Or something. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Let's just... How many Nietzsche quotes can we name up? Okay. Maybe maybe that's maybe that's what we need to do. Go to each movie and find a Nietzsche quote to summarize the movie. Oh, um. So we for the um uh Romulus Ledbetter movie. What was that called? Caveman's Valentine. No, let's you move can do on. without music. Life would be a mistake. <laughs> without me. Okay. But l let's look. Let's get going. Okay, we need to talk about this fucking thing already. Um, <laughs> one thing I, in my prose, one thing I wrote: it's the closest we've gotten to an adaptation of Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea on this podcast. <laughs> so that's true. Which, if anyone doesn't know, that's my favorite book. So you know, I love Jules Verne books. Um, but yeah, so. The movie, it starts off with, like, the beginning of the movie is, like, a submarine getting wrecked, which that was reminding me of a lot of movies, so. Yeah. Especially, I was thinking a lot of Hunt for Red October. Hunt for October. This came out around the same time. I was thinking of Das Boot. <laughs> <laughs> it's, this is also the closest we've gotten to doing Das Boot on the podcast, so there's that. I was also thinking of that teaser trailer for the Spongebob movie. Uh, which one? Uh, the one where... Have you not seen the submarine teaser trailer for the Spongebob movie? I don't remember if I did or not. Oh, let me... Let me find it, because it's actually pretty good. I feel like we're gonna... <laughs> I feel like we're gonna cut... This is... 50% of this fucking thing. Oh yeah, I, I, yeah, I've seen it. I, yeah, I yeah, yeah. this familiar. thing, this thing. That looks familiar. Yeah, I think I've seen that. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty intense opening that gets you interested to see what'll happen. Yeah. So there's that. Um. I think the special effects in this are really good. Yes, and th this is like a lot later into the movie where a lot more of the special effects come in, but a lot of the stuff to do with the aliens just looks really pretty. Yeah, the aliens, they're a very unique design, like, because they look kind of you, you, like jellyfish a bit, where they're like I, I was about to say, they remind me of siphonophores, if you know what those are. Siphonophores. How the fuck do you say uh, that? It, They're like these underwater colonial organisms. They all look pretty unique and kind of like that. do look kind of like that, actually. Um, uh, here, here's another one. Because they're, like, glowing, like, really colorful. Yeah. But they have, like, this clear, like, membrane around them, too. And they so can, they like, change their life. shape, too. They're kind of, <laughs> like... They can, like, form faces in them. There's, like, one part where, like, one of them's, like, imitating, uh... Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio's character. Um, yeah, yeah. Which that scene kind of made me think of Donnie Darko a bit. Because <laughs> it looked like... And I think some of it's CGI, and it's pretty good CGI for that time. Yeah, like, the, the water creature looks really good. It, was, it sort of looked like Terminator 2, the liquid Terminator a bit, which I guess that makes this kind of precursor to that. Um, but yeah, the aliens are like... I, th I think this one best special effects <coughs> at the Oscars. 
That would make sense. Yeah, and it, it does look really impressive. It, especially, especially, like, the water creature with the face shapeshift. Like, it's a very yeah. unique design for an alien. And it, it was also kind of nice watching a movie where the aliens are more friendly, you know? Yeah, they're, they're not out to just annihilate the human race. They're more like the aliens from, like, Close Encounters of the Third Kind or Arrival. Yes than, yes. say, aliens. Where, where it's much more like they have a sense of wonder about them, and it's not, like, trying to kill you. It's not like Alien or The Thing, for example. Yeah. And also, underwater aliens were very new at the time. That's a That was a very new idea for that time. I can't really think of too many movies before that where somebody did that. At least it wasn't, like, a 50s B-movie or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It was also kind of making me think of Sphere, too. Because <laughs> that movie has, like, and the book has, like, these, like, underwater aliens that talk through the computer. Room. It's a way better movie than Sphere. Mm. Way better movie than Sphere. Although Sphere... The movie did not do the book justice <laughs> in that case, because I, I thought the book Sphere was really good. Um... There was one line that kind of made me laugh where a guy says, uh, this place is starting to look like my apartment. <laughs> there, there were a couple good lines If throughout, that's the case, the I'm a little afraid to see what his apartment looks like. <laughs> yeah, there were, there were a few lines. I don't know how many I wrote down. Um, uh, I wrote down, uh, one. Where is it? Why can't I find it? It seemed like they were... It was, again, it kind of just seemed like James Cameron dialogue. You know, when you watch a James it, Cameron It really movie, did. It, it felt like quips that were that would have been, like, aliens or something. Yeah, it kind of did. Which makes me really wish Bill Paxton was in this. Yes. Because I, I feel like he would have been great for the, the guy that had the rat. I feel like that's who... Yeah. I'll get to that when we get to, like, cons, though, but, you know. Yeah. Um. But it was kind of weird, what you know, because Bill Paxton is in, like, almost every James Cameron movie. At least from, like, Terminator to Titanic, anyways. Yeah, but yeah. I think the only exceptions would be, like, this and... I think just this, actually. Now that I think about it, he's in all the... And Terminator 2. He's not in Terminator 2. Those ah, are the only okay, two okay. James Cameron movies from Terminator to Titanic that he's not in. But anyway. Although, speaking of who is in this, I, I thought that Ed Harris was really good in this. I, f I feel like the like the main cast, like Ed Harris, Mary Elizabeth, Master um, Antonio... Master Antonio. Yeah, Ma Master Antonio. Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio and Michael Bean were all very strong. They were good, yeah. Especially Ed Harris. Like, Ed Harris, I've always thought he was a really good actor that deserved more attention. Because, like, everything I hmm. see him in, he's always really good. <laughs> you know? Like, it seems like he's in a lot of movies where, like, people are just in a rough situation and he tries to motivate them, you know? You know, especially Apollo 13, yeah, that's a good yeah. example of that. Like, if I'm going through a crisis, I want Ed Harris there to be given, like, inspirational <laughs> speeches and shit. You, know? I, you, you need an Ed Harris cheerleader in your life. Yeah. You know? Because that's part of why I like Apollo 13 so much, is just every once in a while Ed Harris just, like, gives, like, a great, like, speech or something to get the NASA engineers up off their asses to, you know. Let's work the problem, people. Let's not make things worse by guessing. And he does a good job in this movie, too, at, like, just selling, like, the, uh, the, the more intense moments and also just that sense of wonder yes. that you get from the aliens, too. He, he does really, he's really good at, like, the more emotional scenes, like, when he's trying to, like, uh, revive, uh, Mary Mastrantonio's character. Yeah, that was example. a good scene. Or, or when they're having the argument as to who's going to get the suit when they leave, like, the small submersible. Yeah. Like, he's good at playing angry in a lot of movies, too. Yeah. Yes. 
like a, a Glen Gary Glenn Ross. That's a good example of that. If you want to see Ed Harris just getting angry a bunch and like just saying fuck a lot, watch Glen Gary Glenn Ross. <laughs> <laughs> Like I think he has the, he has the most f bombs in that movie, and that movie also has Al Pacino in it, which is impressive. <laughs> That's impressive. That's really impressive. Oh fuck you! Fuck the lot of you! Fuck you all! And yeah, his chemistry with uh, Mary Elizabeth Master Cho is really good in this. Like you buy that, you buy that they. They're married. Okay, they're married, and they're going through a really rough patch. In yeah, their I, w- I wasn't sure if they were like separated or what at first, but I, at the very least, they're estranged. They're, yeah, yeah, you get that. Yeah, and it definitely comes across in like the scenes between them. You know, they're arguing a lot, but then yeah. just over the course of the movie, they slowly like, you know, basically. This whole crisis, you know, the aliens saved their marriage, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a weird way. <laughs> yeah, I thought their acting was really good. Uh, you mentioned Michael Bean as well. I thought he was hmm. good, although he is kind of he... just, he, he was kind of just a generic James Cameron bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say, he does a great job of going absolutely insane. Because <laughs> uh, they, they kind of, like, build up to it a little bit, where they're like, hey, make sure, like, you know, uh, you're all good when you come up, because when you're trapped down here, you can start to go a little crazy. And he does. And then we get, crazy, like, a... Yeah. Yeah, he goes crazy, and when they throw it off, he's, like, kind of rocking back and forth at a table, and you can see him, like, cutting his arm with, like, a combat knife. And, and you're just like, oh, he's he's losing it. Like, he is gone. Yeah. I just wonder if there's, like, any horror movies that Michael Bean is in where he just plays, like, a total psycho or something, you know? He would be good at it. Because <laughs> I don't usually see him as... I don't usually see him play villains and stuff. The only other movie I can think of where yeah. he plays a villain is, again, Tombstone. Where he also has a mustache. His, I swear, every time I saw this movie, I was just thinking of Johnny Ringo. <laughs> Don't stop. Like, I was just half expecting Val Kilmer to show up and, like, say, Why, Johnny Ringo? You look like somebody just walked over your grave. And he's a bad, yeah, again, he's a bad guy in this. He brought a nuclear bomb down there with him. Because, I mean, of course he did. I mean, you just look at him. The dude just looks like a scumbag. I mean. Yeah. He's got yeah. a douchebag mustache. You know, he's just got a... <laughs> I don't know. It's just. Again, maybe it was also just Tombstone. I don't know. It's just. There's, like, certain mustaches that, like, bad guys <laughs> Just have. look evil. You know, I don't know. Like, again, like, it was making me think of Bennett from Commando. Um, What's the ultimate evil mustache? Ah, uh, Hitler. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that one's, that one's bad. <laughs> I, I was about to say, like, the, um, the guy from Flash Gordon, but no, I guess Hitler's number one. Granted, Charlie Chaplin and Oliver Hardy had the same mustache as Hitler, so I guess it wasn't all bad until Hitler ruined it. Um, yeah, so I thought those three were good in the movie. Uh, yeah. Especially yeah, no, Ed were, Harris. Ed good. Harris, I thought, was very good. Um, and then most of the movie, it's just them fucking around in a sub for two hours. Yeah. And I'll give them this. Okay, so uh, one thing that's hard when you're making this type of movie is making it seem like they're actually underwater, but without actually filming underwater. Yeah. And it does look like they're in an actual submarine. Yeah, no, it all looks fantastically done. Which it can't have been, this can't have been shot all, like, on the water, right? Like, some of this had to have been on I, I think I think there was quite a bit that was, because a lot of the cast members were getting pretty angry at James Cameron for 
Or maybe it was. I don't know. Uh, I guess James. Some of the underwater. I guess scenes. James Cameron is a bit of a lunatic. So I mean, they had to. I guess yeah, they had to have filmed some of this underwater. Uh, let's see, give me a second. Um, okay, they were filming it in like water tanks, so they weren't actually filming oh, okay, it out so. in out in like the ocean, but it was. Underwater, at the very least. Interesting. And yet, so for some reason, he kept filming stuff out in the water. I guess he really liked and it. He really want. I guess yeah. he just became so obsessed with finding the Titanic that <laughs> it kind of became <laughs> his life after that. Because he I, has such I, huge... I will say... Out of, you look out of, at his directing credits, he has such huge gaps. So much water. Between movies. Yeah. After, after, after Titanic, like, you know... Anyway. But yeah, obviously they had to have shot some of it underwater. Yeah. I, I will say my favorite uh, underwater scene in the movie is when they're getting to the um, <clears throat> to the sub that they were looking for. At the beginning of the movie, just seeing it just abandoned. There's like the bodies everywhere. It's dark. You don't know what's around there. It felt like a horror movie. During that, there part. were parts of this. Yeah, I was watching this, and yeah, there were parts of it kind of felt like that. I mean, granted, this is like right after he did Aliens, so yeah, like yeah. the look and feel of the movie was really reminding me of Aliens. You know, or is it just me? Is that just me that this movie kind of? No, feels I, like I, aliens? I could definitely feel that. Um, like I, I was watching it, I kept thinking of Aliens and Terminator Two, like the whole. Because they're kind of stuck the way it was in. Shot. Conf they're kind of stuck in a confined place too. Yeah. As well, kind of like in Aliens, and there's a part in Aliens where like Newt is uh, in the water and getting stalked by a xenomorph yeah. too. So there's that. And then, uh, and then obviously this movie has it has aliens in it too. You know. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. completely different kind of aliens, but, you know, it has aliens. They're, they're a bit friendlier than the xenomorphs. A bit? They're... <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, they're, they're a little bit friendlier than aliens that uh, impregnate you and then burst out of your chest. <laughs> I would say so, yeah. Yeah, um... But yeah, there were parts that were shot underwater, which... Anybody that's able to shoot a movie in the water and make it look this good has my respect, because yeah, yeah. That, that shit is fucking hard. I mean, just ask Steven Spielberg, you know. And it, it was hard to tell, like, when it was actually underwater and when it was just, like, a sound, a sound stage, at least for me, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, Grant, this was kind of before you started getting more, like... This is, like, right before CGI started to yeah, take over yeah. in the effects department. Because wasn't this one of the earlier uh, Lucas, um, or the um, Industrial Light and Magic CGI? I do believe it was. Willow did have some early CGI as well. Hmm. I mean, there were ones before it, but they weren't this extensive with it. Yeah. And then, obviously, Terminator 2, really, you know went all crazy with it when they created a, uh, when they made Robert Patrick look like a yeah, living liquid, a living liquid man. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me if the technology used for Terminator 2 was actually made for the Abyss, and then they just took that and improved upon it. It did kind of look similar at some points, um... Yeah, okay, so I'm just looking at, like, Industrial Light and Magic's milestones. 1989, first computer-generated 3D character to show emotion was in the Abyss. Interesting. I huh. remember if there was, like... I know young Sherlock Holmes had, like, a CGI a character in it. It was, like, a stained-glass window knife that comes Yeah, alive. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Have you watched the ILM... Uh, documentary on Disney Plus. Y you watched it? Yeah, I, have you seen it? I don't know. I don't think so. It, it's actually really interesting. I think I watched... 
I was watching the Star Wars documentary series called Icons Unearthed. I thought, I thought it was interesting. Mm. Um, but no, I didn't watch the ILM one yet. It's because it's I don't have Disney Plus. That's why. Okay, that's fair. Fuck Disney. Um, <laughs> isn't this on Disney Plus? Yeah, yeah, that's where I watched it. Okay. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah. Uh, well, I didn't have to pirate this one, though, because I had the DVD of it. Um, mm -hmm. Very old DVD. I've had that DVD for a while, actually. Uh, the camera work I thought was really good. Yeah. A lot yeah. of long shots I noticed during this. Which is really novel, especially in a time where it seems like a lot of directors are afraid to do that now. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was kind of nice having a movie where things were kind of just given room to breathe, you know? Hmm. Which maybe that's why the movie's so long, but anyway. I will say there's not a whole lot of, like, action scenes, per se. There's only, like, a couple, but they're all pretty good. Like, I, I really like the scene where um, uh, Ed Harris is trying to sneak up on Michael Bean. And he's got, like, the pipe in his hand. Like, that was actually, like, really tense, I, I feel. The one I like, always... The part I would him. always remember was Michael Bean's submersible crashing. <laughs> that was intense. For some reason, I, even though it had been a while since I've seen this movie, I can kind of remember, yeah, Michael Bean, like, dies because his submersible crashes in, like, a trench or something. Yeah, it, it crashes and then it implodes a bit. One of the scenes that I remembered from this movie, even though I hadn't seen it in a while, was this part with the rat. Oh, you mean in, like, the breathable water? Yeah, they put it in that, like, pink yeah. liquid. That it like, kind of looks like jello or something, and apparently you could breathe underwater when you have that liquid on it. And it comes in handy later when yeah. Ed Harris uses it. And I will say, that is like a real, that is a real thing, that uh, breathable liquid stuff. Oh, really? I didn't know that, huh? Yeah. It's apparently really uncomfortable because you're breathing in liquid, but... I wonder if James Cameron himself invented it. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I, I need this for my movie. We gotta make it real. Um... Talked about Michael Bean. Uh, the music I thought was pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it worked. It's an Alan Silvestri score again. It kind of, <laughs> kind, you know, has it. It kind of reminded me of scores from other James Cameron movies, which I feel like that guy probably did do music for other James Cameron movies. Or was that James yeah. Horner? I guess James Horner was usually the guy doing the score for his movies. But anyway. I still can't believe it's the same guy that did Super Mario Brothers. <laughs> yeah, no, that's insane. The live-action one. The one that barely feels like Mario. And yet their names are Mario Mario and Luigi <laughs> Mario. Mario and Luigi Mario. It's ridiculous. I was also kind of... I'm thinking of Deep Blue Sea during some parts of this movie. I mean, kind of, just because it's, like, underwater. It was mainly just but... the stuff where, the, like, when the submarine was getting flooded, it was kind of making me think of that part in Deep Blue Sea when they're, like, running from the water because it's, like, flooding, you know? Yeah, I can see that. Uh, we talked about the aliens. Which, <laughs> they call the aliens uh, non-terrestrial intelligence, NTIs. Oh, yeah, NTIs. Or UFOs, underwater flying objects. <laughs> if they're underwater, it really wouldn't be flying. Sorry, I just ha I just have to nitpick that real quick <laughs> from the movie. They're like, well, they're flying in the same way that like a manta ray flies, I guess. Yeah. It's swimming. It's called swimming. Swimming. Well, they look like they're flying because they're like flapping, you know. Anyway. I wonder, do these alien manta rays sing Let's Name the Zones? <laughs> oh, jeez. I'm surprised there aren't more Finding Nemo references during this. But anyway. 
Dude, it's been so long since I've watched that movie. I used to watch that movie a lot as a kid. Like, whenever I went to my grandparents' house, that was one of those movies that was just always on rotation. That, and like, Aladdin. I watched Aladdin oh, yeah. so much as oh, a yeah. kid. Oh, uh, well, fuck. Where were we? All oh, right, the aliens in this. <laughs> Again, they kind of felt like just, you know, Close Encounters aliens or like, you know. <laughs> yeah, very, very like friendly. And you know, like Spielberg. At the end of the movie, at least Spielberg the... aliens, yes. basically. Yeah. Yes. Very Spielberg. So movies. at the. Which is weird. So I know this James is James Cameron. The... James Cameron made this, not Spielberg. Oh. Yeah. So I know this is one of the differences between the theatrical cut and the uh, the special edition. Uh, was like sort of the aliens and their goals at the end of the movie. Because uh, in the theatrical cut, they kind of just save everyone for no reason and then leave. Okay, so that was that's actually a good point. Okay. Yeah, I was going to mention that. So Ed Harris, he gets saved by an alien that looks like a manta ray, and then he goes to this underwater alien city, which all looks really cool. I loved the look of this yes. underwater yes. city. It was, you know, it's almost like Atlantis or something, you know. But it's, like, glowing. It's, like, glowing, like the glowing aliens in this. And apparently the aliens, they've just been watching TV this whole time. <laughs> Like, is, what, is Chance the Gardener an alien or something? But, um, but yeah, so the aliens, basically, they've been watching humanity for a while. You know, in the, this is in the special edition. Um, and they're, like, worried about nuclear war, basically. They're worried that humanity will destroy themselves. Again, it, this is, mm. there's a lot of, like sci-fi movies like that you know if you've seen like day the earth stood still or like hell even plan nine from outer space kind of this where you have like aliens who are like saying <laughs> you you humans need to stop like being at war with each other you know that shit although yeah, it, i'll yeah. give them credit it's not done in a preachy way in this movie that's good to hear because <clears throat> I, I feel like one of the things missing from the theatrical version was a reason for the aliens to be there. So I guess the special edition is better than the theatrical version in that sense, because it gives them more of a hmm. motive for... Yeah. You know, and it shows that, like... The aliens, they're... Maybe not as benevolent as they seem, you know, because what happens yeah. is they unleash... They're going to unleash a tidal wave. And that's where you see the oh. tidal wave, like, raising up just all over the world. You got, like, crowds of people watching it. But then they stop the tidal wave. Kind of like Moses parting the Red Sea or something like that. Um, <laughs> and then, the, yeah, they let Ed Harris go, you know. But yeah, it was kind of... Yeah, I, I kind of forgot that, yeah, none of that is in the theatrical version, because you're not really given any reason for the aliens to, you know, care about humans, you know. Basically here it's like, but here is here, it's like they're, they're the concerned parents worried about their kids misbehaving, I guess. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, there's some uh, I coke. Think... Oh, sorry, what were you saying? Oh yeah, no, 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 no. Let's talk about the coke machine. Uh, I didn't notice it at first. <laughs> I I didn't notice it at first until it was the middle of a very serious scene, and then I look in the background and see a Coca Cola soft drink dispenser, and got really confused for a second. I mean, yeah, it is pretty handy to have a Coke machine on a submarine, <laughs> so I'll give them that. But yeah, it was kind of blatant. Are, are, are they sending a like a delivery man, like every few weeks to restock the Coke machine for him? Uh, I, I imagine they resurface and just put more in there or something. <laughs> but anyway, it's not quite as blatant as uh, I, I, I think the most blatant Coke product placement we've had on the podcast is still Rambo for Split Part Two. Because they just get the coke out of the machine and start drinking it anyway. 
Yeah, yeah. And if we ever did Leonard Part 6, that has maybe the most blatant Coke product placement of all. Although, I do not want to force you to watch that, because that movie is terrible. <laughs> and it's still not the worst thing Bill Cosby has done, because, well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> because he's Bill Cosby. I'm not getting into that. So. <laughs> Uh, congratulations, Leonard Part 6. You're not the worst thing Bill Cosby has done anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, one thing I was going to mention. So there's a character in this named Jammer, I noticed. Hmm. And this is not the only movie we've done on the podcast with a character named Jammer. What other movie? <laughs> Well, based on my reaction, what do you think? <laughs> Not the only movie. I I don't know. I'm trying to think of what other movie had somebody named Jammer. It's the only movie better than Morbius. <laughs> There's your clue. Oh. Is it is <laughs> Is it the um, Cassini Space Odyssey? Quantum Quest, a Cassini Space yeah. Odyssey, had a character named Jammer, and you're not going to believe which character it was. Well, was it Hayden Christensen's character? Yes, Hayden Christensen's character. Yeah. <laughs> was, I would like to remind you, a lizard space surfer, because that's the role yep. Hayden Christensen yep. was born to play. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Um uh, I thought the lighting was pretty good. Yeah. It, it was nice having a movie where I could see what was going on. <laughs> so that was nice. It was nice having a movie where people could act. That That's was, that too. That was How a long is welcome. It? <laughs> That's a welcome change of pace. Uh because it was not in for man. The Math of Madness is probably the one where that was the case. <laughs> I don't know if the acting in Sith Wars or Inframan was good, though, to be <laughs> fair. There was a pretty good fight scene between Ed Harris and Michael Bean. Yeah. Because yeah. they just get all wet and, like, bloody. Like, it's nice having a fight scene where it actually looks like they're getting all roughed up, you know? Yeah. And their submarine fight at the end of the movie, towards the end of the movie, I should say, is also pretty good. Yeah, that part was good. It's a PG-13 movie, but I mean, it, you know, it doesn't feel too tame. Um, because, I mean, I mean, since it's PG-13, you get one F-bomb, and there's one in this movie. <laughs> when Ed Harris shouts, fuck logic. <laughs> Oh, you also briefly see breasts at one point in this. I forgot about that. Oh, yeah. Isn't it when they're trying to do CPR on Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio? You can just barely see it, but yeah, they, they got away with it. Yeah. I guess you don't I guess you don't see nipples very clearly, so it's... Yeah, it, it's like the side view, pretty much. <laughs> As James Cameron likes his nudity, I guess, so... Does he? I don't know if that's... I can't really think of it. Well, Titanic. I guess Titanic. There's that one scene. <laughs> and then towards the end of the movie, it was kind of... I feel like this is most of my notes. It was reminding me of... You know, anyway. But it was reminding me of Armageddon a bit. Honestly, that that was I. I kept thinking that about Bud. I was like, he feels so much like Harry from Armageddon, and also just like there, you got people in control rooms talking to people in suits with helmets. And yeah, they're like trying to stop a disaster. It kind of, it just again. I was, you kind of see so I, I, again. There, obviously, this was. Before. I asked this question when we um when we watched the two thing movies, but I have to ask it here too. If the characters from The Abyss and from Armageddon were to switch places, do you think they would have worked? Well, let's see. In The Abyss... Okay, in The Abyss, they are... Um... 
what what's their job in the abyss like they're just scientists right uh i think there's a couple scientists i don't remember exactly what they're doing it's like just an it's like an underwater drilling platform i guess so i guess technically they're oil drillers okay that actually might have worked better than armageddon because in armageddon they're just oil drillers yeah they were trained to be astronauts so here you yeah you you just train these guys to be astronauts they make they probably make smarter decisions than <laughs> <laughs> I still don't the plot of Armageddon is just so ridiculous when you actually think about it cuz like why would you train oh, oil drillers so to be astronauts when it would be easier to just train astronauts to drill in space like anyway <laughs> Uh, yeah, Ed Harris gets saved by the alien. Uh, the aliens lift up the boats, which that part was pretty cool, I thought. Yeah, yeah. Really good set design, or I think it was a miniature during that part. Whatever it was, you know. Yeah. And then he reconciles with his wife, you know, they kiss and embrace, the movie ends, so hey, the movie has a happy ending. It's nice having a movie with a happy ending. How long has it been since yeah. like that? It's been a while. <laughs> it was, uh, well, definitely not that one. Um, I, I mean, I guess 2020 Texas Gladiators, it had a happy ending for the characters in the movie, but not for the people still... watching the movie. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. But it seems like a lot of the other movies we were doing, it was just doom and gloom. Like, you look at those John Carpenter movies we did, like, the lot they, they all end with, like, the world ending, pretty much. Well, except Prince of Darkness, it's kind of... Yeah, but Prince of Darkness ends with another, like, foretelling of the end of the world. Prince of Darkness has a confusing ending. It's kind of like, I don't know. And the thing is kind of ambiguous what happens hmm. but then in the mouth of madness that one it's just like yeah you're all <laughs> yeah, fucked no, the world Sut ends for sure sutter kane is in control of like everything okay uh was there anything else you wanted to add for before getting to, uh, uh, i think we're good to move on to cons now cons okay i have a few things okay uh this movie is too long yeah i would say so um that's a problem with a lot of later James Cameron movies, now mm -hmm. that I think about it, because True Lies was too long. Um, Titanic, maybe, is too long. It's been a while since I've seen it. Um, granted, part of why I haven't seen it in a while is because it's three fucking hours. Um, <laughs> Avatar is too long, for sure. Um, he just really wanted to get just start making like borderline three hour movies, <laughs> didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that I, wouldn't I, I have been say... that wouldn't have been as much of a problem for me. I think if it's, it's just if the characters had a little bit more development to them, because really, I thought the characters yeah. in this were a bit thin. The only three that stood out to me were the ones played Ed Harris. <laughs> Uh, Mary Elizabeth, Master Antonio, and Michael Bean. Yeah. And then Michael Bean dies, so he doesn't really have a character arc. Like, the only people in this movie with character arcs are those are the two main characters. That's it. Everybody else is just kind of there. <laughs> you know? Because yeah. usually what happens in a James Cameron movie is, like, everybody fucking dies, so... <laughs> <laughs> it seems... It seems like that, right? I mean, because yeah. most yeah. of the characters in Aliens die, you know? A bunch of characters in Terminator 2 die. Um, True and Lies, I, a bunch of people die. Fucking Titanic, everybody say, fucking dies, except for Kate yeah. Winslet, um... <laughs> anyway sorry what were you saying I, I will say we mentioned Leonard Maltin's review earlier and he said that there feels like there's just one too many things stacked on top of each other when it comes to the plot and I think I agree with him yeah a bit because the, the stakes and like what's happening it's a bit all over the place 
a bunch of people are sent down to fund a submarine that sank before the Soviets get to it, but now they're trapped underwater during a hurricane, and a highly trained and deadly military man is going crazy that has access to a nuke, and there's aliens outside. Yeah, it's kind of all over the place. It, it's a um, bit much, yeah. And maybe part of it is you watch the theatrical version, and I, yeah. I felt like... I felt like it was a little more... It, it was a little more focused in the special edition, mm. at least from what I remember. Um, although I still felt it was too long. Like, it was like... Yeah. The version I watched was almost three hours. I'm like, why does this movie need to be three fucking hours? <laughs> and it's, it's and, just kind of... Too, it's a little too slow-paced. It's a lot of just wandering yeah. around the submarine, which, again, if the characters had a little more to them. That wouldn't be as much of a problem, but that's, again, that's kind of one of my problems yeah. with Avatar. You know, Avatar, I'm not a huge fan of Avatar just because it's so fucking long and you barely get any character development. <laughs> and I, I will say, another, like, comparison point, uh, like, I, this sounds like it was something that was fixed with the special edition, but the theatrical cut, it, the aliens feel shoehorned in. Yeah, it makes more sense what, for them to be yeah. there in the special edition. Because they know. just kind of show up in the theatrical cut and then just save Ed Harris for some reason. Because it does feel like, when you watch it, it does feel like it is two different movies. Like, one is like a yeah underwater exploration movie, and the other is... Is Michael Bean has a nuke and he's coming for you. Well, that and aliens, you know, yeah, close yeah. cars of the third kind. Um, yeah, it was a little bit too. Yeah, maybe there was a little too. There's a little too much going on, a little too little going on at some points. So. Uh, another thing I was gonna mention: uh, not enough water. Really, not enough water. <laughs> um. No jar of dirt. <laughs> <laughs> I I will say this movie. This movie is very blue. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, the, you look like, at the cover up. The, it's like blue. There, there's some movies that they'll put like that, like gross, like light brown or yellow filter over it. And then there's other movies that are just blue. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This this one is blue. Yeah, James Cameron. Uh, Got obsessed with blue Daba D before that song even came out. <laughs> and what wasn't Terminator Two also really blue? Like there was kind of a bluish tint to everything. Maybe Aliens was a little bit. Yeah, because like I, I see this poster and all I see is blue. Yeah, blue, blue, electric blue. That's the color of my room where I will live. <laughs> It is a good poster for The Abyss. I like the poster. The Abyss is a really good poster. The, uh, I guess depending on which one you're looking at. But, like, I mean, it has a very... I'm looking at like the Y that's, like, going down into a trench. The font is very memorable on it. Um, hmm. Especially with, even like, yeah, how the Y goes down and it's kind of glowing. But anyway... Um, someone left the cake out in the rain. Oh, wait, that's not even a movie. Um, <laughs> the, although, the, okay, actually, kind of kind of going off of that. Some of the dialogue is a bit weird. It is very weird. Then again, James Cameron was never the best at dialogue. I, although what helps here is he has pretty decent actors for the most part, you know. Yeah. But just there would be some lines where I'd be like, okay, that's kind of weird, you know. Um, <laughs> queen bitch of the universe. You know? <laughs> There's the... Um, Which is that the a David one Bowie guy reference? that has the rat that says... Uh, the guy with the rat says, I've got to tell you, I give this whole thing a sphincter factor of about 9.5. I didn't know people rated sphincters. That's weird. It's a really weird line. I don't know how often, like, James Cameron writes his own dialogue, but yeah, that was a... 
I guess he wrote he wrote Aliens. Um, did he yeah. write Terminator Two? He wrote okay. He wrote Terminator Two with someone else, and then True Lies. I feel like True Lies had more than now. Nah, he that went on his own, I guess. He just really wants to be an auteur, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. And I mean, I, I can't argue with him in some aspects, because I mean, look at some of the movies he made. <laughs> um, he wrote Rambo First Blood Part 2. I mean, that's a masterpiece. You know? Uh, I also just, I just don't find this one to be as memorable as some of James Cameron's mm. other movies, which granted, that's some very stiff competition. I mean, this is sandwiched between his two best movies right here. Yeah. Right, right before this, he did Aliens. And then right after this, he does Terminator 2. So, like, I mean, trying to live up to that is almost impossible. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. I think part of it, it's just, it's just not as fun as some of his other movies i feel like this movie is a lot more yeah. serious it's a lot more serious it's a lot slower there's just sort of less for the characters to do especially if you compare it's a lot more serious especially if you compare this to true lies which is like very yes that is a very yes. comical tone to it you know um granted it's not quite as serious as titanic but you know <laughs> And then Avatar, I mean, how can you get any more serious than Avatar, which is like, <laughs> what, dances with wolves in space? I mean, hey. <laughs> because I, I think just part of it was just the humor just didn't land in this one as well as it did in, say, Aliens, you know? Yeah. I think yeah. the humor worked better in Aliens. And hell, even Terminator 2, like, that's got a few funny parts that I like, you know? If not just because of, you know, the Terminator trying to learn how to be human in <laughs> that one, you know. <laughs> Chill out, dickwad. <laughs> <laughs> Hasta la vista, baby. Um, but yeah, it's just, again, you know, James Cameron, he's made some movies I really, really enjoy. And then this one, it, it's good, but it's not, you know... It's it's not great. But yeah, yeah, over the, actually, that's kind of getting into overall thoughts. Unless you had anything yeah, yeah, else, yeah. do you have anything else to add? I, I, th I think I'm I think I'm ready for overall thoughts. Okay, so overall thoughts. Um, again, I I like the movie, but like I said, it's not quite top tier James Cameron. So like, <laughs> it's not Aliens. It's not Terminator Two. You know? But I would say it's about on. The same level as like True Lies or maybe Titanic. Again, it's been years since I've seen Titanic. Um, I certainly like it more than Avatar or Avatar Way of Water. I certainly like it more than those two for sure. Um, the Abyss. Um, good visuals. I think it's got an interesting premise. <laughs> Decent cast. Especially Ed Harris. It's well directed. It's maybe a little too long and, you know, could have used a bit of rewriting him. But yeah, it's pretty good. Um, basically, it's a James Cameron movie, <laughs> you know. Mm. It has the some of the best things about James Cameron and also some of the things that, yeah, it shows he... Even some talented filmmakers, they can have, you know problems okay you can go <laughs> sorry so I, I as for my my overall thoughts I, I agree with you on a lot of these points it is a good movie but i wouldn't call it a great movie i think i would actually put it a little bit lower down than you i i think that true lies is a much better m much better much more fun movie to watch than the abyss that being said i still think it is a good movie i think it's worth giving it a watch if you're into james cameron movies it is shot really well. Uh, the three main characters, I think, are really good. There's a lot of very emotional scenes, especially between Ed Harris and uh, Mary Elizabeth uh, Mestrin. 
Master Antonio. Sorry. That's a very um, weird last name. I don't know. It, it, it's hard to pronounce when you just Where do you have to be from to, to get a last name? Like, okay. Uh, Italy. That's where. Yeah, okay. Her parents were Italian. Yeah, that, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, it's a very beautiful movie. There's some well-acted parts. It stretches on for too long, in my opinion, though. But other than that, it is a... It is a good movie. That's a unique, you know, we don't get too many uh, unique alien designs nowadays, so this is kind of interesting, you know. Yeah. And kind of also, you know, it, it was a <laughs> back when they would sometimes make movies where the aliens weren't trying to kill us, you know. Hmm. Well, they kind of do in the special edition, but anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> what do you want to do Terminator next or something? I mean, <laughs> I wouldn't mind doing Terminator at some point, but um, just the first two though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't want to watch Dark Future or whatever the last one was. I thought it was called Dark Fate. Dark Fate, <laughs> whatever it is. I don't give a shit. I haven't seen it. I don't want to. <laughs> I guess Terminator, I guess I don't like any of the Terminator sequels after the second one. Hmm. Because I, I love Terminator 2, and just every every movie after that just makes me depressed, you know? <laughs> Even Terminator 3 makes me depressed, because basically Terminator 3 is like, oh, the second one was pointless. <laughs> hmm. You know, and that's what all of them do. They're just like, oh yeah, the previous movie, that was pointless. <laughs> even like, I, I heard like Dark Fate, oh my god, let's not even get into Dark Fate. I hate that movie, yeah, I haven't even yeah. seen it. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> just from what little I've heard about it, I don't, I do not like what they did with that movie, but anyway. Uh, but if we, we won't be doing any... <sighs> James Cameron movies for a while, but we are going to be doing some Arnold movies at some point. Um, but next, we will be doing a two-part. Uh, yeah, I guess it's going to be two movies and a couple extras thrown in. It's a double, episode. a double feature, technically. Yep, double feature with some reviews of trailers thrown in the middle. I guess, yeah. But yeah, so that's Join us okay. next time for Grindhouse. Grindhouse, yeah. That's going to be an interesting one. How the hell are we even going to review? Because we got to talk about all the we fucking will. trailers. How many trailers are I, we I, at? Wait. Uh, I think it's like four? Five? Five. Five. Uh, okay, that's not that many. One of them is uh, the inspiration. <laughs> right. I forgot about that. That's where Machete came from. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Wait. Sorry. I'm sorry. The uh, Machete was in the Spike Kids movies. But yeah, Machete. <sighs> okay. It's kind of. Anyway. Fu- oh my god. Wait. Okay. We're going to have to talk about that too. They have adapted. Yeah. Okay, what the hell? Um, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if somebody took some of these other movies. Okay, we'll have to talk about that when we get to it. Anyway, so yeah, yeah. Grindhouse. Yeah, um, yeah um, pull the string. You know, roll the clip. Andy Griffith. Good night, you stupid idiot. <laughs> Good night, you miserable slob.